Thank you so much for coming tonight. This is the third annual Blood Singer Songwriter Symposium. Anthony, thank you. Uh, uh, I think most of you know me, but if not, um, my name is Mingo Reynolds, and I am the director of the Center for Programs in Contemporary Writing, which is part of what this wonderful Kelly Writers House does. Um, and unfortunately, since Al Phil Reese was not able to be here tonight, I get to have the pleasure of introducing um, our wonderful guest tonight. Um, but I did want to make a few thank yous first. Um, first off, the Writers House staff, um, including Aaron Gouch, who's back there, Jamie Lee Jocelyn, who's over here, John Carroll, Jessica Lowenthal, who's probably in the kitchen working on something. Um, thank you so much for helping support me in coordinating this program. Um, I, I obviously could not do it without any of you. Um, I also wanted to make sure to thank Michaela Majun and Roger LeMay for coming. They're our XPN colleagues, and they make, they make music on campus every day. So thank you for, for uh, making time to be here tonight, because I know it's going to be a, a great night. Um, also, uh, Steve's colleague, manager, friend, I'm not sure what else, <laughs> Danny, Danny Goldberg is back there. Thank you so much. Um, and I also wanted to thank Mitch and Margot Blutt for being here. This is the Mitch and Margot Blutt Singer Songwriters Symposium. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And it also happens to be Mitch's birthday tonight. So happy birthday. I hope this will be a really great birthday present for you. Um, Steve Earle is here with us tonight, and he is not only, as you all know, a, sing a songwriter, but he also has written um, a collection of short stories, and he is working on a novel that he's going to complete very soon. Um, and I was uh, privileged to, to read um, the collection called uh, Dog House Roses, and there was a passage in one of the stories that um, sort of seemed like an appropriate thing to read tonight, so uh, please bear with me. This is um, a narrator uh, from one of the short stories, Billy the Kid, um, talking about writing songs. Once I got to know some real songwriters, I learned quickly how hard it is to marry words and music into a seam seamless creation. Even then, it isn't really a song until you sing it. When a writer first breathes life into his latest creation, that instant, when an idea born on a melody leaves his lips, is rare and magical. Most people never get to witness that. Even if they do, they might not get it. Well, I'm guessing that most of us in this room have never witnessed that particular moment, but we've heard your song, Steve, and we know the magic lives within you, so we're so glad to have you here. Thank you. And now, with great pleasure, I'm going to introduce Anthony De Curtis, who will be conducting the interview tonight. I'm sure all of you know who Anthony is, but he's... Um, not only a wonderful teacher here at Penn, but a contributor to Rolling Stone Magazine, New York Times, and many, many other publications. And I know him personally as the best interviewer there is. So <laughs> thanks a lot, Anthony. Steve, of course, thank you, for, uh, thank you for being here tonight. Well, I wanted to ask, I mean, as somebody, uh, as you are, you know, someone who has written you know, other things than songs, I wanted to uh, ask you about the idea of writing and when it first kind of presented itself to you and in what form. I mean, did you, get, did you start out thinking about songwriting or did you start out thinking about uh, you know, writing fiction, you know, how did, how did writing come to you as, as something that was possibly something that you might want to do? Well, it was about songwriting. It never occurred to me that I could write anything besides a song until I was almost 40. 
Um, I mean, I think I thought about it and I talked about it, but there were, there were several obstacles in my path, which were one is typing, you know, and my handwriting's <laughs> my handwriting's illegible, and uh, I can't even read something that I write in longhand if I wait longer than fifteen or twenty minutes before I return to it, and. Um, uh, I pissed people off because of what they thought my handwriting said. <laughs> and, um, I don't. I've successfully forged prescriptions. I have to admit, on a couple of occasions, and my handwriting was very believable as a doctor's. Um, I um, typing. I started out in personal typing in high school, typing forty-five words a minute. And by the time I completed the course, I typed thirty-five, and uh, I just. There was, I just didn't think it was anything that I could do. And also, I, I only got through, um, I went to the ninth grade twice, but I didn't complete it either time. So, um, it, songs, writing, you know, making up my own songs, um, I think that occurred to me as soon as I, I figured out, uh, it's Beatles records. It was the, the idea, I think I made the connection literally from realizing that what that parentheses under the title was when I noticed that that said Lennon and McCartney and I knew who those guys were and figured out pretty pretty quickly that that meant that they wrote the songs and it wasn't all the songs uh, on the first Beatles records I heard but it, it after a while it was all of them and and I think that was the first time I realized that songs came from somewhere and uh, so I wrote songs uh, mo the first songs I wrote all had girls names as titles and uh, I had a friend in high school who wrote this song. It was he was a genius. It had he could change the title and the girl's name, and it was still <laughs> as rhyme. necessary it was like, yeah, as appropriate. Like, he got all the way through high school. To use the term loosely, one, one yeah. song. Yeah, it was amazing. And, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's true. Um, it's like, is that you know, the old uh, the Onion headline? You know about. Uh, you know, sort of Lower East Side boy, you know, actually makes new mixtape for a new girlfriend. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's what, the idea of um, putting writing and songs, making up songs. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in an era when, when songs suddenly became you know, talked about and viewed as, as an art form. I mean, you know, I don't know how that happened, but it happened really, really fast. The idea that pop songs were art, that, you know, people thought that much, you know, uh, the Beatles, but a lot of it happened because of Bob Dylan more than anybody else. I think, I mean, you know, that's the, that's when it really ratcheted up. And it wasn't that, that he was the only person doing what he was doing. Um, you know, uh, folk singers, I live in Greenwich Village now, and I've lived there for the last few years, and, and it's one of the things that's fascinated me was is the history of that place and that my job was sort of invented in that neighborhood in the sense that... Steve lives on the street that the um, the Dylan album, uh, God, the name of which escapes me, right? At Free the Will and Bob the Dylan. The Free Will and Bob Dylan, where Second. Dylan is walking down the street with Susie Rotolo. That's the street that... Uh, Susie still lives in the neighborhood, too, and uh, she grew up in the neighborhood. She still lives there. And um, uh, I spend a lot of my time turning Germans around so they don't take their picture facing in the wrong direction. Because <laughs> the place where they should be standing is literally right in front of my apartment. And um, it's, um, you know, it's that deal of um, a lot of things happened, and they happened really fast. I think people wanted, um, you, know, the, the, uh, you know, Bob Dylan wanted to be a pop star, and... and John Lennon, you know, I think wanted to be an artist and, and they became aware of each other. And, you know, I think, you know, you've got to hide your love away is, is you know, John Lennon trying to be Bob Dylan. Yes, and, of But the, the, the important thing is, is Bob Dylan was trying just as hard to be John Lennon as John Lennon was trying to be Bob Dylan. And, and you know, the idea that um, because of political issues that were going on and people writing about them, I mean, at first all these guys were singing songs that were 100 years old. And then a few people in Dylan wasn't the only guy. Tom Paxton started writing songs of his own. A handful of other people started writing their own songs. And they caught shit from other folk singers for doing it, you know, for having the audacity to actually make something up of their own rather than than just keep singing the same songs, you know, over and over again. And, and um, it's, uh, in fact, it got to be, you know, there's, you know, this story about Dave Van Rock and Dylan, the version of, of House of the Rising Sun that Dylan recorded was Dave Van Rock's version. And, yes, and there was a little bit of tension about that because he didn't, 
he didn't let Van Ronk know until the day after he had actually recorded it. <laughs> it was already in the can. Um, at the time, Van Ronk's wife was Dylan's manager. Um, but it just got to be um, – I grew up in that era – when suddenly songs were looked at as, you know, writing songs was considered to be an art form. And, um, you know, I can remember living in Mexico. Uh, for There was a period in the late 70s, uh, well, mid to late 70s, that I sort of lived in Mexico and commuted to Nashville, which was a long commute, but it made sense in my life at the time. And uh, I, I ran into a guy in San Miguel Allende who was a writer who wrote, you know, books. And I remember being drunk and feeling sorry for myself and, and uh, saying, well, man, you know, I wish I'd stayed in school and I could do what you do. And he said, he said, man, what you do is like, you know, arguably, of course, he was being, you know, morose and, and feeling sorry for himself, too. But, <laughs> you know, he's, like, he's like, fucking Prince dead, man. You know, like what you're doing is literature that you can consume when you're driving your car. And, and there's some truth in that. The idea that, you know, we all of a sudden had stuff that we could, you know, um, songs being written written at a really really you know at a literary level and um you know in a time when not not even all books were written at a literary level so it it uh, and i just grew up with that so i was lucky and and, and it's it, it that kind of songwriting became expected and became something you could make a lot of money at it became you know a pop mainstream thing now that era may be over. I mean, uh, we may be more like jazz musicians and bluegrass musicians, and, you know, now it may be a lot more of a hardcore commitment to decide you're going to be a song. My, my son's second record came out yesterday, and I went and saw him last night at the Mercury Lounge in New York, and just realizing that I don't know what to fucking tell him, you know, about what, what to do, because the music business, as we know it, you know, imploded a few years ago. Uh, I still have some people, I didn't, I'm not selling that many less records, you know, I, my records... Sales haven't um, suffered as many as you know, as much as younger people's do because my fans are old too and they they can't figure out how to download. But it's <laughs> <laughs> I saw so I still s sell some records and it's uh, it's not um, but it's 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 interesting. I think it, it, the time the this period of time that I learned to write songs and you know up to this point, it's like this whole thing began and to some degree you know, ended and you know, during, the, during the time that I've been doing it. And it's, 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 kind of, it's, kind of, it's kind of spooky. Well, you know, when we first met, which was back in the early 80s at the Moonshadow Saloon in Atlanta. Yes, I forgot about that. <laughs> um, was I opening it for Delbert McClinton? Is that possible? I, I think, think you may well have been. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, it, I was, I think the little EP of Steve Earle and the Dukes, it had maybe had just come out right around that time. Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. A, it was a three, I had a three-piece rockabilly band and we did a, Four cut EP, and that ended up getting me our first major label record deal. I'd been, I was 27 or 28. I'd been in Nashville for a long time. I'd been writing songs and um, got a few songs cut. None of us, you know, my sort of wave of songwriters in Nashville, none of us wanted to be country singers, and none of us wanted to be, uh, thought we were going to be the next, you know, big, you know, successful commercial country songwriters. We basically um, had figured out that. Um, that we could get money and not have to get jobs because there were people <laughs> that that they under there were publishers still in town that understood that you had to get um, we were there because of Chris Christopherson the idea that that somebody could come there who was basically writing at this really really high level and and obviously you know um, you know he was he was a Rhodes Scholar and and um, the songs were songs that you could speak about in the same breath as, as a Bob Dylan song, but he was also writing, you know, like for the good times. And, and, and it was the, there were some publishers in Nashville still when I got there in 1974 that realized that you, in order to get um, Help Me Make It Through the Night, you had to let Chris Christopherson write The Silver Tongue Devil and I. It was just that we were sort of left alone. And, you know, we did the night shift and tore their offices up and, and, um, and left songs there and, you know, well, I remember, I mean, this wasn't actually the question I was going to ask, but I remember you're telling me uh, when we talked all the way back then that Elvis was going to record one of your songs, and then it, suddenly it didn't happen. I was pissed off at him for years, even though he was dead. Um, <laughs> he, um, yeah, it was, it was a song um, that I, you know, I had a three-piece rockabilly band, and I was writing songs that were sort of in that, that vibe, and Felton Jarvis, who, who produced the last few, you know, Elvis records um, 
they were trying to make a record that was um, him getting back to recording a, a more stripped down recording is a little bit more back to his roots whatever they were and and um recording in nashville for the first time in a long long time because a lot of stuff you know heartbreak hotel was recorded in nashville it was not new york it wasn't memphis that's that's nashville and in, in, in uh studio b at columbia and um no rcab the old rcab and um the um it um they had the he came over from memphis and the rumor we heard was that that I, the song was up, but that for some reason Elvis had never actually gotten through a take of any songs. And he had gone back to, he got back on the plane, went back to Memphis, and they never actually recorded a note. The band was there. And I found out years later, Tony Brown, who, was, uh, who signed me to MCA Records uh, in the mid-'80s, was the piano player in the band at the time. They had rehearsed my song. It was the one song the band had learned, and they were waiting for Elvis to come and record it, and the fucker never showed up. So, which <laughs> co- cost me a fortune. I mean, yeah, it would have been a nice payday. Absolutely. <laughs> no doubt about it. But what, the question I was going to ask as a result of that uh, conversation all the way back in the early 80s was um, uh, I asked you what you wanted out of you know, doing what you were doing or what, you know, what would be most meaningful to you, and you said that you felt – that if there was a certain type of song or even a certain type of guitar lick or just something that people identified as, oh, that's a Steve Earle song or that's a Steve Earle lick. And I was wondering, uh, I, I, was, I was struck by that at the time, and I was wondering if you felt, uh, you know, how would you characterize that at this point? You know, is there a way to talk about a Steve Earle song? I think one of the reasons that, we're, that anybody's still talking to me at all <laughs> Is that that's changed several times over the years. And I think, I mean, I've sort of been forced to constantly reinvent, you know, what I do. And I think everybody has to do that to a certain extent. But, I mean, there have been periods of time that um, a friend of mine said, he asked me once if I wasn't afraid of, I mean, he had known me for all of that time. I was 19 when I got to Nashville. And, and he said, um, it was David Only. He's a uh-huh. great songwriter. And and um, he said, uh he said, you used to worry me. So I, I said, I, it worried me that you were going to, I saw you go through many cha- so many changes that, that I was worried that you would lose your identity somewhere along the line. And, and you know, I mean, I guess that danger is there, but I think it's also, um, you know, being fluid and changing is, is kind of, it, it is conducive to art. I think it's a lot more conducive to art. I mean, you can write songs. Songs don't have to be art. Um, it can be a craft. And that's totally okay, but that's not what I do, and it's not what I intended to do. It's not what I started out doing, and it's it's Towns Van Zandt is, is what it all boils down to. I met Towns Van Zandt when I was 17 years old, and I saw somebody make writing songs at this incredibly high artistic level, and he wasn't making any money doing it, and only a handful of people knew who he was, but he kept doing it anyway, and he had a lot of other stuff that was you know stacked up against him too but he kept doing it and he kept doing it at an incredibly high level for a long time and and uh that's what i decided i wanted to do it was a conscious decision you know it's like it is like the bluegrass thing i mean i was trying to explain how committed bluegrass players are and the fact that that i'm not you know i sort of dabble in that because i'm a songwriter and and you know that's i can bring that to the table when 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 I play bluegrass and you know I made a bluegrass record because I wanted to write an entire record of new bluegrass songs and um but those guys that do it all the time you know I'm talking about you know forget about you know oh brother you know forget about you know the things that these these the Flatt and Scruggs and, and Bonnie and Clyde in, in the 60s things that have happened along the way that 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 crank up people's attention to it from time to time on a day in day out basis being a bluegrass musician is mean it's like being a jazz musician it's like it's deciding waking up one day and deciding you're going to practice an art form that will be tough to become proficient at it'll take you years to even become proficient you'll never fucking master it no matter how hard you try you'll be it, as soon as you stop learning and as soon as you stop growing in it you're dead. It's over. No one's going to pay any attention to you anymore. And you'll and it guarantees the decision guarantees you'll never make any fucking money. <laughs> and, and it's like it's a hardcore thing to decide you want to do something like that. And I did decide. Luckily, 
I had seen people that I knew had a huge amount of artistic integrity, make a lot of money in the music business. So I always had that, that possibility <laughs> hanging out there. And I did think about it a lot. And, um, but I did make the decision I was going to keep doing it, whether I, whether I made that kind of money or not. Well, I wonder, um, you know, we talked about uh, you know, Steve playing some songs tonight. And I wonder if you'd play one of, one of, one of the songs that I regard as uh, a kind of early Steve Earle classic. Uh, and I wonder if maybe you could talk about it a little bit. What's you that? Know, goodbye. Okay. Well, it's, it's not that early. It's like <clears throat> kind of interesting. It's 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 the earliest song in my second life because um, I almost died, and that's that's what happened to me. And and for and it was all my fault. Not any doubt about it. Um, and I didn't write anything for almost five years, and um, I didn't do anything but. Uh, for five years, but uh, what junkies do, and it's, uh, I was a junkie before that, but I, it became a full-time job the last five years, but, um, so this was uh, literally written in a uh, treatment center in uh, southwest Tennessee, and uh, it was the first song I'd written in like five years, and uh It's basically just a, a ninth step in the key of C. All them longing on nights I put you through Somewhere near Sure I made you cry But I can't remember we say goodbye But I recall All of the nights down in Mexico One place I may never go In my life again Was I all somewhere or just too high? But I can't remember if we we'll say goodbye.
Like a soft breeze Blowing up in the Caribbean Most Novembers I break down and cry Cause I can't remember if we say goodbye But I recall All of the nights down in Mexico That's one place I never go In my life again I'll somewhere Or maybe just too high But I can't remember If we we'll say goodbye Can't remember If we we'll say it Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Thanks. Steve, as someone who, um, you know, has both, uh, you know, spoken so eloquently about songwriting and obviously just demonstrated it, and um, you're about to release an album of songs all written by, you've mentioned Towns Van Zandt, uh, and the album is called Towns, and uh, I wonder if you could talk, you, you've said a bit about him, and but I wonder if you could talk about meeting him and what he was like, and, and what is it about... Uh, Towns' songs, I mean, you, one of Steve's perhaps most famous interview quotes is about uh, being willing to stand on Bob Dylan's table, uh, coffee table in his, in his cowboy boots uh, and saying that Towns Van Zandt is the best songwriter in America. Uh, and Towns said, man, that was really nice what you said. I heard what you said. It was really nice, but I wouldn't try it, man. I've seen Bob Dylan's bodyguards. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I started doing this like, um, you know, I, 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 I ended up being a songwriter and playing acoustic guitar, a long, I hadn't had an electric guitar until I was 27. And, um, that happened because my dad didn't really want me to have an electric guitar. And, um, there was a lot of kids in the house and it was already pretty noisy as it was. And I could make my guitar sound like. You know, more, you know, like the Rolling Stones records that had acoustic guitars and the Beatles records that had acoustic guitars. And that got me towards, there was a lot of good acoustic music around. And I started backtracking to, you know, earlier Bob Dylan records from the first ones that I heard. And, um, but I started playing, I started making up my own songs, and I was too young to play places that served liquor, so that meant coffee houses. I could get in there. And they were, there were coffee houses around because it was, you know, it was 1969, 1970, and 1971. Um, I was a freshman in high school in 1969, and you know, I was 14, and I discovered there was a place called the Gate House, which was in downtown San Antonio. And there I first started hearing about Towns, and I started looking for his records. His first record came out in 68. And um, this guy lived in Texas. He was like in Houston, from what I could tell, most of the time, but he didn't really live anywhere. He was, he was like itinerant, and he'd, he spent his summers in Colorado, and he wintered in Texas and Tennessee and if you're standing in the right spot on the planet you know you could catch it when it came blowing through and uh, you know everybody I knew that came from Houston or came from Austin had stories about towns um, then I, I went to Houston first when I left home first time I ran away from home when I was 14 I went over there and managed to elude my parents for a month but they caught me and brought me back and um, I finally ended up going over there 
I guess I was 17 when I moved to Houston on my own. And um, I used to play a place called uh, Sand Mountain, which Mr. Bojangles' Jerry Jeff Walker song was written in the upstairs apartment there because he lived in he lived in the apartment above. And, and when you played there, you know, you were looking at a mural on the back wall, which was Jerry Jeff Walker, Mickey Newberry, um, Guy Clark, and Towns Van Zandt. And you could see the mural really well when I played there because there was nobody fucking there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Completely unobscured. And um, it... Um, in that room, I saw Matt Slipskin and Lightning Hopkins in the same room at the same time on about three different occasions. I opened for opened for Matt's once. There were people there that night. Um, you know, I just started hanging out, and then there was another place. This place called Anderson Fair Retail Restaurant. That's you know, I love it. Nancy Griffith both came out of that place. They both played there a lot. Um, I wasn't allowed to play there after the first couple of times I played, and the reason was I I never ran into towns into any of those places, and it was because he and all of his friends by the time I got to Houston were banned from there, and from both of those places. And where they hung out, it turned out, was a place called the Old Quarter. So I went down there because I was looking for Towns Van Zandt. There's no doubt about it. I'm playing. There's maybe the room's about the size of this. There's nowhere near this many people in it. And um, the guy that owned the place, Dale, so far uh, was there. I think Rex Bell, who was the co-owner, was probably there that night too. Or he was in and out of there. He was always in and out of there. And uh, Dale's dog fell in love right in front of the stage during my first set it was from some, with somebody else's dog that they brought in. You know, nobody was going to watch me while that was going on, so I just gave, <laughs> gave up and went back upstairs. And I came back down through the second set, and Towns Van Zandt sitting in front of the stage and with his feet. And the stage at the old quarter was about, you know, about this size. It was just like, I think it was a couple of, you know, cargo pallets put together, and, you know, maybe a board nail on the top of them. And he's literally sitting there with his feet up on the stage like that. He says, play the Wabash Cannonball. And uh, he was, he'd been drinking. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I just ignored him. This is like the guy I was looking for, and, and he was heckling me. And uh, <laughs> so I played, and he never made his sound, I have to say, um, while I was actually singing. But as soon as I finished playing, he said, play the Wabash Cannonball. And um, I'm like, I, I finally had to admit I didn't know the Wabash Cannonball. I, mean, <laughs> I hate Roy Acuff. And um, it, um, it ended up, uh, finally, he wouldn't shut up. So I finally, I played a song called, uh, called uh, Mr. Mud and Mr. Go, which has the town that has about 100,000 words in it, and he shut up. And uh, I, you know, talked to him after the set, and um, I became one of those people that sort of just waited for him to, to come through. You know, they're in Houston at first, and then uh, a few years later, I went on to Nashville, and uh, because I knew Towns, and, and uh, you know, that gave me an automatic introduction to Guy Clark, who was already in Nashville by that time. I played bass in Guy's band. And, um, you know, I got to, it was a real live um, apprenticeship. It was like that still existed. Was there something specific? Uh, you know, obviously, just being around somebody like Towns, uh, you know, you would learn a lot and just listening to him and listening to his songs. Was, did he ever um, give you any advice about songwriting? Well, there, it was a dual apprentice. I was apprenticed to two people, Towns and Guy. And I don't know whether you know about Guy Clark, but Guy, Guy and Towns were, they were real live. Towns died, uh, you know. About 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah, right? almost a little over 10 years ago. And, um, he, uh, Towns and Guy were real life for life, unconditional best friends. And, you know, I hope that, you know, um, well, against hope that when, that when I die that I have one friend anywhere close to as good a friend as they were to each other. Um, but it was very different. Guy would actually show me how to directly do things, you know, like, yeah, I'll start out, I'll put a, I mean, mechanically, the way he laid song. And it wasn't, he wouldn't tell me to do it this way. He was telling me, this is how I do it. And it was like, you know, put a, you know, put your, uh, once you get, you know, the inspiration part of a song, which is usually a verse, if you're fucking lucky, or a chorus, and you write it down, you know, write the lines down, the way they make sense to you and the way they break down, and then go down and number the next verse, you know. Because we were trying, you know, we were trying to write songs that, 
you know, most of us were trying to write songs within a certain form. And I think, I don't know why I did it. I, I, I was trying to emulate songs that I had already heard uh, when I first started out doing it. It just gave me, you know, a form to work in. But I think, you know, years later I heard, uh, as Allen Ginsberg said that, you know, that it was meaningless to learn, to, to break meter until you'd learned how to write meter. That, you know, he's talking about, you know, writing poetry in general. And, you know, we did learn that. We did learn... Um, you know, we, we weren't sure we didn't have any names for it, and we didn't necessarily... Well, these guys, you know, Towns had a, had part of a college education. Guy had a college education, and, you know, they, they knew more what they were doing than I did, but I could watch what... Guy could show me a way to go about it, a form, you know, a, a template. With Towns, it was more like... Um, he found out I hadn't read Bury My Heart at Wind and Knee, and... <laughs> He went. He dug in the back of his his house forever and ever until he found this beat to shit paperback copy. You remember the old original cover with Geronimo on the front of it, and and um, it buried my heart at Wind and Knees by D. Brown. And it's like it was one of the first accounts of of Native American history through the eyes of of the nations themselves, and you know um, it. Um, he gave it to me, and he said. And while you're at it, read this. And he handed me a, this huge fucking beat to hell cloth bound copy of War and Peace. <laughs> <laughs> I said, while you're at it, read that. You know, so, um, it was like I was stranded there. My band had broken down, so I, I was stranded for a while. I was kind of, it was in my commuting back and forth in Mexico period. And towns by that time had sort of settled in Tennessee. And, took a while to get the money together to fix the truck. And then the people that I hired to fix it ran off with the money and I had to get the money again and and then so I unfortunately had time to finish both books before I actually <laughs> got my van out of Towns' driveway and so I took the books back to return them I actually returned books and still and um I took them back and and um and uh he said what do you think about bury my heart at Wendy Knee and I said I want to thank you man for making me read it, it blew my mind and he said he said, um, what about War and Peace? And I'm like, it's kind of long. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was pretty cool. And, um, you know, and he started asking me all these questions. They were all about War and Peace. None of them were about Barry Mahari and Wendy Knee. And uh, I said, well, you know, I'm glad, but I'm glad I read it. I said, you must have read that in high school or something. He said, no, nah, man, I never read it. I just thought you should. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> And and he'd tell you not to always put the top back on the bottle because otherwise you'll kick it over. And um, <laughs> it it was never it wasn't directly about um, songwriting yeah, about songwriting. It was about. <laughs> but it, there were times, you know. I, I think he. Um, I remember one time I was getting. It wasn't always necessarily good advice, but it was always something that you could use, and you know, the, it's stuff that stayed with me. I remember. Not very long after that, I, I went to Mexico, hung out there for a while, came back, and the publishing deal that I'd been living on for a couple of years had it had run out, and I needed. To, I thought I hadn't had a job in a long time, and I didn't want another one. And so I was getting ready to go to town and take some new songs around, and and town said, "Where are you going?" I said, "I'm going to town." He said, "What for?" And I said, um, I "Said I got to try to get a publishing deal." And he says, "You don't need a publishing deal." I said, you, he said, I "Said you're not Bob McDill, you're like Woody Guthrie," and. I said, fuck you, man. Don't put that, you know, it's like, I, I need a job. I don't, I don't want to get a job. And so I didn't do necessarily what he, what he told me to do. I did eventually get a publishing deal. It took a long time because I'd already had one and had failed. You know, nobody was able to get my songs recorded. But, um, but I did think about that, and I did, uh, it did reinforce that idea that, um, I had to be somewhat protective of what I would and what I wouldn't do, and I and I still am, as far as uh, I think. And this is not, you know, um, this is not about what anyone else should do, and it's not. Uh, I don't. Re I, I have no regrets about stuff that I've done in within the music business. I regret a lot of things, but almost none of them have to do with making art, and I'm and I'm really proud of that. I don't have any records that I'm ashamed of. Not a single solitary record. There's some I would do different if I did them today, but you know it wasn't today. And and um, 
you know, they're, none of them make me cringe when I listen to them. And it's all because I think I took myself seriously. I didn't think I was Woody Guthrie, but I didn't think I was Bob McDill either. And Bob McDill, it's important to remember, wrote Amanda. But, you know, one of the best songs I've ever heard. He also wrote Baby's Got Her Blue Jeans on. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, I wonder, uh, perhaps you could play one of Townsend's songs for us. Oh, yeah. Um, you make a record of Townsend's dance songs, there's like this incredible bunch of, uh, I mean, it was amazing. The list for this record, there's 15 songs on the record. And um, there's... Uh, I usually won't put that many of my own songs on a record anymore because my record label won't pay me for any more songs. I think it's 11 or 12 or something like that. So I finally, a couple of years ago, decided, Bucky, if you won't pay me for them, I won't put them on the record. And, um, but with Towns, I just decided to let the record label fight it out with the Witter Van Zant. It wasn't my problem. And, and, um, and I wanted, you know, it was hard to narrow it down. I started out with with, uh, I remember the last cut before I finally cut it down to 15 was 28 songs. So there's like, you know, he wrote a lot of songs. He wrote most of them between the time he was 18 and 35. And then he wrote a handful of really great songs between 35 and when he died when he was 52. But uh, the song he's most known for it's been recorded several times. The first person that I know that covered it was Amy Lou Harris. There may have been somebody before that. This thing's still objecting to. Still recovering from the Odetta Memorial. Um, I recorded, the day I started recording this stuff, um, I recorded the song first, and it was like uh, the theory was it's like the first day in jail. You go out on the yard and you pick up the biggest motherfucker out there and you knock him out, and then you get to keep your radio. So I recorded this first. <laughs> Living on the roof, my friend. It's gonna keep you free and clean Now you wear your skin like iron And your breath is as hard as kerosene Weren't your mama's only boy But a favorite one it seems She began to cry when you said goodbye I sank into your dreams Poncho was a bandit boys His horse was fast as polished steel He wore his gun outside his pants For all the honest world to feel Poncho met him at you know On the deserts down in Mexico Nobody heard his dying words That's the way it goes All the federalists say Could have had him any day I only let him hang around Had a kindness, I suppose Left he can't sing the blues all night long like he used to The dust poncho bit down south And did up and left his mouth The dead lit for poncho low Let this split through how And how it got the bread to go There ain't nobody no All the federalists say Could have hit him any day We only let him go so wrong Out of kindness, I suppose Poets tell how Poncho fell 
Left us living in a cheap hotel The desert's quiet, Cleveland's cold So the story ends, we're told Pontu needs your prayers, it's true But save a few who left it too He only did what he had to do All the federalists say Could aid him any day We only let him slip away Out of kindness, I suppose A few great federalists say Could aid him any day We only let him hang around It's a good song. <laughs> it's a wonderful performance. You know, well, we were talking earlier, and Mingo mentioned, uh, obviously, in introducing you, you know, you've written a collection of short stories, still in print. And this is a fucking miracle in and of itself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were talking about it on the phone the other day, and Steve mentioned, yeah, it sold 38,000 copies in hardcover. Man, that's pretty good. Um, and yeah. uh, that's why it's still in print. Yeah, well, that and the fact that I can, you know, they'll keep printing them in paperback as I sell them in my shows. <laughs> um, but the uh, you're working on a novel now, and I've been working on it since I, you know, since about a year after I delivered the collection of short fiction, which was, you know, about it's been almost eight years, and since I started it, and and you know, I there it's been fits and starts because I had this day job and. um I wrote a play in there somewhere and produced it twice, once in Nashville and once in New York. And um, it's it's hard. It's you know the problem is I've written songs all my life and most of them are written in a day. I don't care how good they are. You know there, there's there's been exceptions when I was you know distracted or a lot of which is a lot of the time and. Uh, that I've taken, you know, more than one day or more than one march on a song, but the vast majority of them are written in one day, and that's what I'm used to. And that's the thing, you know, I'm an addict. It's, you know, instant gratification. I'm, I'm an addict, and I'm an American addict. And um, <laughs> I don't, um, you know, getting the idea of, um, you know, a book is like, I mean, this isn't going to be a huge book. It's not, this is not going to be War and Peace. This is going to be, you know, you know, maybe 300 pages. And, um, uh, but it's uh, it's uh, it's been it's been a trip, and and, and part of the reason, um, if it gets finished, I'll have uh, I think it will. I'll have Towns to thank for it because it was just the idea that I wanted to do this Towns record for a long time. But it got down to a point where I had, you know, I made Washington Square Serenade, and I and I toured to support it, which is what I do, and um, and. When you do what I do for a living, more and more and more, it's always been most of my income. But it's touring. even a high, yeah, touring for me. But it's even a higher percentage of my income now, and it's just the way that it is. And I'm okay with that, you know. For um, but um, it makes it's made it hard to finish this book. It, it I thought I, at one time I'd be able to, you know, I travel on pretty nice buses, and uh, I thought I'd be able to do this on the road but I can't. It's just too many things going on and you have to get up, you know. I have to do this to finish it. Right now what I'm doing, I work on it every single day. I took a, day, a couple of days off in the last couple of days to write another piece that was for money. And um, it was um, it was a, um, it's a forward to a new edition of of uh, A Death in the Family, James A.G. book. And, and um that uh, it's AG would have been a hundred this year, and um, um, so I took a couple of days to do that. It was supposed to only take one day to write. It took two naturally, and um, 
Yeah, but it's that thing of just you have to getting up and putting your butt in the seat to write the same thing every day. You know, even the poetry that I've written has been relatively short. Um, short stories, as far as as far as prose go, they fit my lifestyle a lot more than than a, than a lot of novel does. But anybody that writes knows, you know, publishers don't want short fiction; they want they want novels. And and uh, I got tricked into writing this novel, full length novel, by my editor. Um, and he did it by, he figured out that, um, just like he tricked me into in my original book, uh, he found out that I was um, a Joseph Mitchell freak, so he met me, he he had me meet him for lunch at the Oyster Bar in Grand Central, which was a, a Mitchell hangout, and he, um, that got me, you know, I immediately liked him, and, and uh, you know, that started him talking me into writing enough stories to put together a collection and publishing the first book. He found out that um, um, one of my favorite books, if not my favorite book, is a book called Coming Through Slaughter by Michael Ondaatje. And it's Michael Ondaatje's first novel. It's this really <laughs> incredible transitional piece of literature that, that Ondaatje will probably go to his grave remembered as a poet. And I, I mean, I think in the long run, because his poetry is stunning. And he wrote poetry for a long time before he wrote any prose. And, um, Coming through slaughters like um, it's this it's a poet writing a, a very, very poetic novel. It's like on the road in that sense, but you're talking about somebody that wrote for a long time and and you know got more of a chance than Kerouac did to sort of write poetry and refine it and do it over a period of time and he taught and then he writes he, he he's a music fan and um I know him he's 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 um I, I'm actually in one of his books <laughs> and uh I it's, I met him, he's Canadian, and I'm, I actually, I do better in Canada than I do here. And uh, um, Coming Through Slaughter is about Buddy Bolden, who was a cornet player who lived and played in New Orleans at the turn of the last century. And he never made records for a lot of reasons. He lived long enough to have made records, but he wasn't in great shape. He was basically insane by the time recording started. And so no real recordings of Buddy Bolden were made. But Louis Armstrong and every other cornet player that came up in New Orleans around, around him and after him heard Buddy Bolden. So in a way, we have all heard Buddy Bolden. He was the most influential musician in New Orleans of his time. So legend has it that Buddy Bolden disappeared for 30 days sometime in, you know, 1909, I think. And, and um, when he came back, he was never the same again. And, and for the most part, coming through slaughter is... Michael's idea of what might have happened to Buddy Bolden during those 30 days. And it's it's stunning. It's like, um, it has these long poetic passages that, that sound like, like, like jazz. It sound like, you know, like a cornet player. And, and you know, that's what he was trying to achieve. And I think he, I think he pulled it off. And, and um, so, um, you know, my editor was trying to, he said, why don't you write something that has something to do with music? And I was very resistant to the idea. I think he originally thought, had in his idea, there'd be a record accompanying it, and that's not going to fucking happen. I, you know, I, <laughs> I try not to, you know, put all my eggs in one basket. But uh, it's, um, I'm pretty protective of this. I do it, um, I know I'm never going to do this as well as I do that, you know, as well as, well as I write songs, but, you know, I also paint, and I do that horribly, but it can, trust, trust me, it, it contributes to the songs that I write. I think it's really important to work outside of your comfort zone, to write songs that you wouldn't normally write if you get a chance to for some you know, legitimate reason and can justify the time, and to, to work outside of you know, what you normally do. So, um, you know, I only started writing prose because a friend of mine who I'd written songs with had started writing prose, and she she, without my permission, gave a couple of my stories to the guy that, you know, that became my editor and, and you know, signed me to my first book deal. And, uh, you know, it was one of those things. And it's, it's, it's one of those deals that I never thought that I, I wrote the first line of prose that I ever wrote in my life when I was 39 years old. So, you know, it's, uh, it's not, uh, so this has been a long time, but I think I'm going to be able to finish it before, um, uh, before I have to go back out on the road to support the town's record. So, uh, well, let's, uh, let's hear some of it. If you... Well, let's see. 
what we got here. I don't know how this is going to go because I haven't read any of this in a, anywhere in a long time. I, about three or four years ago when I was working there, I read a little bit of it at a, a thing, a, an event sort of like this at the University of Tennessee that a friend of mine put together. But um, And I haven't really read any of it since. And a lot of it's been reworked, so we'll see how this goes. This is, uh, I'm going to read, the book is called uh, I'll Never Get Out of This World Alive, which is the title of a Hank Williams song. And the reason that it has that title is the book is set in 1963 in San Antonio, Texas. And um, the protagonist is a defrocked doctor who's a heroin addict who supports his habit by uh, performing abortions, patching up gunshot wounds in the middle of the night. And um, 10 years earlier, he was traveling with Hank Williams when he died. Now, there have always been rumors about a guy uh, traveling with Hank Williams when he died that wasn't there when when towns when the, when he when Hank was actually pronounced dead, and um, that's weird. Towns and and, and uh, Hank died the same day, New Year's Day, um, and I think Towns did it on purpose. Um, it um, it's. Um, there were always rumors about a guy who was, he was actually a quack when I did the research that there was this guy that was a doctor that had been, that they'd been treating, that had been treating Hank and that he was actually traveling with him when they headed from Knoxville, Tennessee, headed towards Canton, Ohio. And then he wasn't there uh, once the police actually came and, and discovered that, that Hank was dead. And um, the re my research, um, in my research, I found out the guy wasn't really a doctor. He was a quack who thought he could cure alcoholics by treating them with chloral hydrate, which is a barbiturate, and um, which is a really, really dangerous thing to give an alcoholic. But uh, um, in towns, I mean, I did it again. Hank, Hank died with a, fair, a lot of morphine and some alcohol and a lot of chloral hydrate in his, in his system. You know, that, that were all, all his drugs were found there. So... My character, I'd already gotten sort of uh, enamored of the idea that the guy was a doctor. So this character is completely and totally fictitious. And um, it's, 10 years, um, it's 10 years after Hank's dead. And this is actually the opening of the book. And um, it goes like this. Doc woke up sick. Every cell in his body screaming for morphine, head pounding, eyes, nose, and throat burning. His back and legs ate deep down inside, and when he tried to sit up, he immediately doubled over, racked with abdominal cramps. He barely managed to make it to the toilet down the hall before his guts turned inside out. Just like every day. Day in, day out, no pardon, no parole, until he got a shot of dope in him, it wasn't going to get any better. Doc knew well that the f physical withdrawal symptoms were nothing compared with the deeper demons and mind-numbing fear and heart-crushing despair that awaited him if he didn't get his ass moving and out on the street. The worst part was that three-quarters of a mile of semi-molten asphalt and humiliating hustle lay between him and his first fix, and every inch would be an insistent reminder of just how far he had fallen in the last ten years. In the old days, back in Bossier City, all Doc had to do was sit up and swing his needle ravaged legs over the edge of the bed, and his wake-up shot was always right there on the nightstand, loaded up and ready to go. Well, almost always. And sometimes he'd awake in the middle of the night, sweating, swearing that someone was calling his name. When morning came, he was never sure whether that it wasn't a dream until he reached for his rig and found it was empty. In any case, he, only, he had only to make it his way to the medication cabinet in his office downstairs to get what he needed. Pure sterile morphine sulfates measured out in precise doses in row after tidy row of little glass bottles. And he was a physician after all, and there was always more where that came from. But that was then, sighed Doc to himself, and this is now. The sad truth was that these days he had to hustle like any other hophead on the street, trading his services for milk, sugar, and quinine-contaminated heroin that might very well have made its way across the border up somebody's ass. San Antonio, Texas was less than a day's drive from New Orleans, but Doc had come there via the long, hard route, slipping and sliding downhill every inch of the way. Inch of the way. Consequences of his own lack of discretion and intemperance had driven, had driven him from his rightful place in Crescent City society before his 30th birthday. 
In one desperate attempt after another to escape his not-so-distant past, he had completed the circuit of the Gulf Coast in a little over a decade, taking in the seamier sides of Mobile, Gulfport, and Baton Rouge. But when he landed in Bossier City, Shreveport's black sheep sister across the Red River, he reckoned that he had finally hit bottom. But he was wrong. <laughs> let's see. Um, and let's get down here to... Um, in the book, uh, he, uh, one of the things he does, like I said, to support his habit is to, is, uh, he performs abortions and this, uh, one customer shows up, um, who happens to be, um, it's actually, um, uh, a young girl, uh, who doesn't speak English. She's, uh, she's, uh, recently come, uh, up from Mexico with her boyfriend who's, who's comes from San Antonio. He's a, he's like a, he's like just a West side kid. And, um, very, very unusual for, for doc to perform an abortion for, for anyone Hispanic. It doesn't happen very often. He treats, you know, mostly, you know, he, he's prostitutes. He, he works in a red light district. He treats prostitutes. He treats, other people, but very rare, rarely Hispanics because they're Catholic and and um, and especially nationalities, you know, Mexicans up from from across the border. That almost doesn't happen. There's a there was a myth that I used to hear about growing up in Texas that people went across the border to get abortions. It didn't fucking happen. Mexico is a Catholic country. You know, it's a lot more illegal there than it was in Texas when I was growing up in the '60s. Um, he performs. Um, this abortion for this girl because her boyfriend pays for it and then he abandons the boyfriend abandons the girl and she ends up becoming part of his life and staying there that she hasn't really become that she's already showed up in the story by by the time you get a few more you know pages down to what i'm getting ready to read she's back in the in the hotel recovering and doc's actually feeling like he's on a roll because he's starting to make a little bit of money after a slow period so he goes back down to the beer joint where he sort of hangs his shingle up just to see if somebody else will show up and he might make a little bit more money and he's got a little bit of dope in him so he so he feels better so this is the beer joint uh down the street from the boarding house where he lives and works and the happy hour crowd began to filter in Unlike the daytime patrons, these folks were mostly squares who busted their backs all day long building houses that they could never afford to live in or repaving perfectly resurfaceable roads in neighborhoods way across town. They arrived in groups of three or four, drank a pitcher of beer between them, and maybe shot a game of pool before hurrying home in time for supper. It was always one of them who dropped the first nickel in the jukebox. The Mexicans usually played records by the local conjuntos like Santiago Jimenez or Trio de San Antonio or maybe one of the big mariachi bands from Mexico with the blaring trumpets and a singer with a voice to match. Songs about the black-eyed girl they left behind and the beautiful mountains that they would never see again. Fine. Sad songs in a language that he barely understood were easy enough for Doc to tune out. He knew some of the melodies by heart and hummed along when he was in the mood. But when one of the redneck boys lurched towards the jukebox fishing in his wranglers for a nickel, the hair stood up on the back of Doc's neck. He knew it was only a matter of time before one of these pecker woods bellied up to the world and punched in N26. You're looking at a man that's getting mighty mad. I had a lot of luck, but it's all been bad. Fuck me, Doc grumbled under his breath. Not that he was surprised. He'd spent a lot of his life in bars all over the South, and it never fucking failed. Old Hank, dead and buried, needs six feet of rusty red Alabama dirt for the better part of a decade now, still taking their nickels and making them cry. Doc looked around the room. There were construction workers, warehouse hands, soldiers from Fort Sam and layabouts on disability. They ranged in age from their early 20s to 70-something, but they all loved Hank. They loved him when he was alive, and now that he was dead, they loved him even more. Even the Mexicans loved the son of a bitch, even though most of them couldn't even understand what he was singing about. Hank's songs were their very own trials and tribulations set to a rock steady beat they could dance to. They each and every one believed that old Hank was singing to them. Individually, or at least exclusively, to people like them, working folks, regular guys and gals who kids to raise, bills to pay, most of them overdue. They had no way of knowing that at that very moment, somewhere across town in solid old, old money Victorian houses in Almost Park and Alamo Heights, 
Doctors, lawyers, and politicians were mixing themselves a highball and cranking up their hi-fis. Oh, they had plenty of Frank Sinatra and Nat King Crow records on their, on their automatic changers, but when they were drinking, only Hank would do, and there wasn't one of them that would pay a dime to hear any other hillbilly singer in the world. Doc wondered why they all insisted on doing this to themselves. Didn't they know what was getting ready to happen? One of Hank's records dropped into place on an automated turntable in a dimly lit room. Even the initial rumble of the needle in the well-worn grooves sounded lonesome. The crying steel guitar was the bait, but it was the beat that set the hook, and by the time Hank's voice crackled from the speaker, it was too late. There was no escaping now. Jesus Christ, that voice, that gut-wrenching, heart-rending wail that got down to your bones like like a cold, wet day. The keening of a hillbilly banshee heralding imminent doom. No matter how I struggle or strive, I'll never get out of this world alive. That's enough, goddammit, Doc shouted out loud, but only a handful of patrons paid any attention and none of the regulars even looked up from their beers. They'd all witness outbursts from that crazy old man who sits at the table in the back of the joint, but they could never make heads or tails of what he was going on about. He just does that, they whisper. He talks to himself sometimes. Doc pried his fingers loose from the edge of the table and propelled himself through the door and out in the street. It's hot and dark and quiet. The street lights cast elongated shadows on the empty street, out of kilter trapezoidal ghosts of simple one and two story structures that once housed respectable businesses. The pawn shop was a barber shop once where people gathered to trade neighborhood gossip and tell tall tales. The abandoned building across the street was a family-owned hardware store, bins filled with shiny new fasteners and fittings of every description, wing nuts and carriage bolts and ten penny nails. But like Doc, the buildings are derelict now, has been shadows of their former selves, waiting around for time to take its slow but steady toll. The familiar fall of faltering steps follows behind him. The shuffling echo ceases abruptly each time Doc breaks his stride, but he knows from experience that even if he turns around, he'll see only a shadow stretching from sidewalk to sidewalk like a black chasm opening in the middle of the street. So he just keeps on walking, and the ghost follows him all the way home. It switches right there, uh, and I'm, you know, I butted heads with my editor about this a couple of times, but I'm not fucking changing it. Um, there are passages throughout the book, and it, it, it is patterned after coming through slaughter in the sense that it changes to this present tense voice in, when Hank shows up. And um, so what, you know, he, Doc goes on back to the, to the uh, boarding house. And um, let's see what I'm going to read here. I got one more piece. Hank's ghost is a character in this. He's been following Doc around for 10 years. And um, he kind of has to go wherever Doc goes. And um, he doesn't know why. And Doc doesn't know why. And wishes he fucking wouldn't. Um, he's, um, he's always there. But Doc only deals with him directly when he's high. And it's not that he doesn't. I think when I first conceived this relationship between these two characters, I thought that he didn't hear Hank and didn't see Hank except when he was high. And, but I, all along the way, I've changed my mind about that. He hears him, and, and he can see him, but he just doesn't pay any attention to him, and he certainly doesn't converse with him when he hasn't got um, a fair amount of opiates in the system. Um, the girl is still recovering from... Uh, from her abortion, she actually had a, only men are hem, hemophiliacs, but but women can can be bleeders. And she actually, the reason she got left behind is because she had to spend the night after her procedure because she because she bled and um and then the boyfriend disappeared. So she's still recovering in the boarding house, and um you know Doc's been out and and taking care of some business and come back and uh, he's got some dope because he made a little money. And um, uh, he's had one of the girls, that, one of the prostitutes that lives in the boarding house watching over the girl while he's been gone. And he comes back, and, and the girl's asleep. It's the middle of the night, and it's, you know, it's, uh, he hadn't had a shot of dope in a while, so he does a pretty, pretty big shot of dope. And Doc likes 
really, really big shots of dope. I mean, huge shots of dope. And um, so I'm going to back up a little bit to just before it's going to switch again to, but this is sort of the end of it. Says, uh, um, says he's talking to the girl that he, that's been watching Graciela, the, the Mexican girl for him. He says, Dallas, honey, would you mind finding Manny and bringing us back a good piece of dope? One bag for Dallas, which she tucked away in her brassiere for later. Three for Doc, which he dumped in the spoon all at once. Doc was only just able to lay his rig on the table before the rush reached his extremities and his arms hung limp at his sides. This was it, the precipice. Doc balanced precariously on the edge of a tiny flat whirl, one foot on the ground and one poised to step off into the abyss. Nothing to it. Hardcore dope fiends like Doc sought this destination just this side of death every time they got off. Doc's curse was that it was that in that place that Hank's voice grew loudest and clearest. She sure is a pretty thing, Doc. Doc's out of his chair in an instant, but it takes him a second or two to bring the ghost into focus. Hank's on the foot of the bed, one bony leg crossed over the other and a spider-like hand reaching towards Graciela's thigh. Doc lunges on unsteady legs. Get away from her, goddammit. She's just a child, for Christ's sake. Doc isn't certain. Did Hank leap across the bed or collapse out of his grasp like smoke and rematerialize on the other side? Doc rounds the foot of the bed in an attempt to shield Graciela, but the ghost stretches himself like a rubber band, elongating his already impossibly angular frame and leering over Doc's shoulder. Yeah, right, like you wouldn't fuck her. Still wobbling, Doc lights on the edge of the bed, and Graciela stirs but mercifully doesn't wake. The ghost shrinks to life size or perhaps a bit smaller, and settles in a chair by the door. You ain't got nothing to worry about, Doc. I can't touch her, no how. Doc checks to make sure that Graciela is still sleeping, and then he picks up his own chair, lifting and carrying it as quietly as he can manage across the room, and sets it down opposite Hank's. Okay, Hank, you want to talk? Let's talk. But quietly, and with a minimum of uh, theatrics, if that's possible, you're going to wake the whole goddamn house up. The ghost leans forward and cranes his neck until his face is only inches away from Doc's and whispers his, cold breath, his breath cold and vaguely foul like a deep freeze full of out-of-date meat. Them Docs can't hear me, neither Doc. You know that. They just hear you when you holler back at me and they think you're losing your mind. Who says I'm not, Doc Trudge? Who says I'm even talking to you right now? I mean, at the moment, I'm high enough to hunt ducks with a rake, and as a physician and a lifelong inveterate dope fiend, it's my more than qualified opinion that the long-term use of narcotics causes irreversible brain damage. You don't believe that, Doc. Hank pouts, pivoting ner noiselessly in his chair and very nearly disappearing altogether as he presents a nearly one-dimensional profile, head back with his nose in the air like a wounded schoolgirl. What I don't believe, Doc qualifies, feeling a little guilty for hurting Hank's feelings, is that there's any such thing as ghosts. Hell, Hank, I'm an educated man, a medical doctor. Ex-doctor, Hank challenges. You said so yourself. All right, ex-doctor, but my legal difficulties with the state of Louisiana notwithstanding, I simply don't believe that you exist, and what's more, I never have. Even if I was ignorant enough to believe that the spirits of, de of the dead walk there seeking revenge or whatever, I'd be shaking in my boots about now, and I'm not. And there's the proof right there, Hank. I'm not scared of you, and I never have been. Not since the first time I thought I heard you calling my name back in Louisiana. So either I am crazy, or you're just as pitiful an excuse for a ghost as you were for a human being when you were alive. Doc knows immediately that he's gone too far and braces for some sort of paranormal conniption, which never comes, but he immediately wishes that it had. Hank, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, oh, for Christ's sake. The ghost stands up, head bowed, lip protruding like a dejected child, and dissolves through the wall. <laughs> So, so uh, the new characters that have come along in the last couple of months, most of that stuff was written before this march began. Uh, I've expanded some of it, but there's a, um, there's a priest coming who becomes, um, who becomes like uh, fascinated with the Graciela because she's sort of, uh, um, she has her own uh, sort of, uh, magic about her as it turns out um and there's a uh, ex-football player um transvestite prostitute that uh becomes the priest's guide around um uh, the south press strip 
as he's trying to track Graciela down. And um, we'll see what happens after that. <laughs> well, um, one thing, the one thing maybe that we haven't talked about so far is, uh, you know, obviously you're somebody who's uh, made a name for yourself also as an activist. And um, there's a song of yours that's always been a favorite of mine uh, that uh, it's called LS Unit One, yeah. and it was part of um, the Dead Man Walking soundtrack. And I wanted to just ask you if you could talk about the idea of, you know, obviously the death penalty, you know, is an issue that, you know, has been very important to you. Just how you go about, do you start writing a song? If you have an issue in your mind, how do you go about dramatizing it in a song? You know, do you try to... Um, you know, find a way to to put a face on it, or you know, where did, well, where did the song come from? I suppose is maybe well. What I'm I mean, it started because I was. Um, it's it's very very early, shortly after I got out of jail in in '95, and I'm training Cummins out, and I'm touring with Norman Blake and Peter Owen and Roy Husky, and uh, we're on the way. Um, actually, a couple nights later, we'll be at that show at the Bottom Line in, in New York, which is the first show I'd done in New York in years, and uh, I'm kind of getting my life back together, and and my manager calls me and says um do you know the actor tim robbins and i said yeah and he said i don't know him but i know who he is and he said he said well he he wants your number he wants to talk to you because he's he's cutting a film um in new york and he and he wants uh he wants to talk to you about music and i i said give him the number i was at a hotel in pittsburgh and he called me and he said that he was he asked me if um he said he was making a movie called called dead man walking and i said as in Sister Helen Prejean's Dead Man Walking, because it, it was based on a book by Sister Helen Prejean. He's one of the, she's one of the going, you know, um, she, in my opinion, um, before the advent of all of this momentum that we've, that we've received uh, in the movement against the death penalty that was brought about by wrongful convictions, I think Helen was one of the most effective activists out there. She came to the issue um, because she was asked to witness an execution. And it's what our connection ended up being because um, uh, I ended up witnessing an execution because I was asked and didn't know how to say no. And, and Helen was my was the key part of my support group, you know, in trying to prepare myself to do that and to, and to survive that um, afterwards. And, and Helen, you know, it's funny. I, we did a lot of stuff because this was my main area of activism. And, and uh, you know, I can remember running into to Sister Helen in Rome. It was like, I was going to Ireland anyway, and some friends of mine were doing a death penalty event that they were putting together, a small speaking tour in Italy. A lot of the money in the movement against the death penalty in the United States comes from Italy. Uh, when someone's executed in the state of Texas, the Coliseum in Rome is always lit at night. Um, it's, uh, that's because of the community of San Giudio, which is a Catholic lay organization. It's mostly doctors and lawyers. And a lot of the money that for years and years and years that went into fighting the death penalty in this country came from people in Italy. Because trust me, when you get outside of this country, you know, they think that we are barbarians because we do this even before we attacked a country that hadn't attacked us. They thought we were barbarians. And um, and it's always been my belief that, that a country that didn't have the death penalty would have never attacked Iraq in the first place. I mean, you have to be thinking in terms of retribution to get from thinking someone has to be attacked because of what happened in New York City on September 11th. That requires retributive thinking. Um, Tim was trying to make it a balanced movie. He's opposed to the death penalty, but he was trying to make a movie that recognized the fact that not everybody feels that way, and that there are good reasons why they don't feel that way, that people that have lost someone to a violent act have every right to their anger and their pain and you have to respect that if you're going to deal with this issue you can't there's no way in the world that you can ignore that um you know it's important also to remember i don't oppose the death penalty because i'm trying to save anybody on death row i'm i oppose it because of the damage it does to me you know i believe that in a democracy if the government kills people then i'm killing people and that i i, I object to the damage that does to my spirit I think it's bad for all of us, and I think it diminishes all of us as a community if, if, if people kill in our names. Or if we, it's us, it's us doing the killing. It's not them, it's us. And that's what I object to. Um, there's a scene, and you know, Tim you know, sent me the movie. I watched it on the bus, and um, 
there's a scene in the movie where, where Sister Helen's speaking to a guard, and he's been doing this. He's participated in several executions, and he, um, it's, he's having a crisis of conscience. He's not sure you know, how many more executions he can, he can deal with. And, and he says, uh, she asked him, what, what do you do during the execution? He goes, the, the left leg. And she said, what? My job is to strap down the left leg. And that's part of the, the, pro, the protocol involved in, in executions in the United States are designed to dehumanize the person that's being executed to, to, to lessen the impact on the people that have to participate in that execution. And that was the thing. When I witnessed an execution, which was actually after I wrote this song, it, you know, all my suspicions were concerned. It was just, it was the idea that I came away with it with an, with an incredible amount of empathy for the people that had to participate in that execution. I mean, Jonathan Nobles, whose uh, execution I witnessed, he was guilty of a really heinous crime. And uh, he changed a lot while he was in jail, but it, you know, it, he wasn't innocent. Not, innocent guys don't write me for some reason. I've never, you know, I've corresponded with a lot of guys on death row, but they were every single one of them guilty. And I don't know what that says about me, but, um, but um, death row in Texas, where I um, did my walking set in Louisiana, that's where it happened. And, but death row in Texas, where I come from, at the time that I wrote this song, at the time that I witnessed an execution, there was called Ellis Unit One. I was fresh out of the service It was back in 82 Raised some came and I come back to town I went in to be how I could be Come home without a clue Made dawn and had to settle down So I just hired on at the prison Guess I always knew it would Just like my dad and both my uncles done I worked on every sub life now And things were going good Until this transferred me to LS Union 1 Swing low Swing low, swing low and carry me home. Now my daddy used to tell me about them long nights at the walls. How they used to strap them in the chair. Kids down from the college and they'd bring the beer and all When the lights went out, the cheer rose in the air I guess folks just got too civilized Old Spark is gathering dust Cause no one wants to touch a smoking gun They got that injection now, they don't mind as much, I guess. They put them down on Ellis Union 1. Swing low, swing low, swing low and carry me home. I seen them fight like lions, boys. Seen them go like lambs. I helped to drag them when they could not stand. I heard their mamas crying when they heard the big door slam. I seen the victim's family holding hands. 
Last night I dreamed that I woke up with straps across my chest And something cold and black pumped through my lungs Even Jesus couldn't save me though I know he did his best But he don't live on Lily's Union 1 Swing low, swing low, swing low and carry me home. Swing low, don't let go. Swing low and carry me home. Thank you all for coming tonight. And thanks to Steve Earl, of course. Thanks.